Hello, I'm Professor Simon Hazlitt and I'd like to talk about how to extract radial area from oceanic sediment. Now, much of the material we use to look at radial area and other microfossil groups comes from oceanic drilling projects like the deep sea drilling project, like the ocean drilling program and now the integrated ocean drilling program that's currently underway. Now, when material uh, comes back from those legs of those projects, um, they're usually uh, long cores. Um, now, at the end of each one of those cores, um, the, the drill system used on the ships out at sea has to catch the, the, the sediment so it doesn't slip out of the drills, what we call the drill strings. Now, those catches are called core catches. Now, when scientists are on the, on the, on the ship, they can actually quickly scoop a bit of that sediment to have a quick look at the types of uh, fossils that will be present in that sediment and, and that's called the core catcher material um, and you can very quickly look at the preservation and the, and, the, and the different types of species that you're likely to find within the core but generally that core catcher material is not used for scientific study because you're not quite sure of where that sediment has dropped down from but the core itself is usually housed in a plastic sleeve um, and is protected from contamination. And so when those sleeves are opened, usually by slicing down the, the sleeve itself, um, the core can be looked at uh, and samples taken at intervals, usually 10, 10 centimeters down the core, 10 centimeter intervals down the core, and then that material can be taken and processed to extract the radial area to, look, to, to, to enable them to be examined. Now, for this type of unconsolidated sediment that we get back from these uh, from oceanic drilling, um, they're us it's usually quite a muddy uh, deposit, and in order to separate the radial area out from the mud and other microfossils that might be present, what we need to do is to wash the sediment uh, through a set of sieves. Now, the sieves that we use are very much like, like this one. Um, this happens to be a sieve with a mesh size of 63 microns. And Radial area, we, we would actually have another, another sieve on top of this of 150 microns. And so the sediment would be, top, be put on top of the top sieve and washed through. Now, everything finer than 150 microns would go through the top sieve, and uh, everything greater than 63 microns would be then caught in this lower sieve, this size. And in fact, it's the material that's caught in this sieve that will contain the radial area that we want to look at. So everything that goes through, we're not really interested in that, that's all finer than 63 microns. Everything that was caught on the 150 micron sieve, we're not really interested in that as well, because that's probably too big uh, for the radial area we want to look at. But of course, this material is valuable, so we don't actually get rid of it, we keep it. Um, so the material on here uh, is what we want to, to retain and for our examination. But within that uh, washed sediment, there will be radial area, which are silicious uh, microfossils are made up of opaline silica. But there will also be lots of other types of micro microfossils like planktonic foraminifera which are calca uh, calcareous, uh, calcium carbonate in composition. Now in order to make it easier for us to look at the radial area, what we would then do is wash this uh, residue with dilute hydrochloric acid, about 10% dilution. That way, it would actually dissolve the calcareous microfossils, like the planktonic foraminifera, and like calcareous nanofossils, and it will actually get rid of those and they would dissolve and wash, wash straight through the sieve. Which would then mean we're only left in the sieve with the silicious or the non-dissolvable fraction, which will, in the deep sea uh, sediments, will be mainly uh, radial area, um, which is silica, but also other silicious microfossils, such as diatoms and silica flagellates. Now, once the material is, up, is, is in the, caught in the sieve, we would then want to wash that out and put it into a beaker. Now, at, at every stage of this um, processing, we want to make sure that we put the correct label for the sample on the beaker and then subsequently on anything else that contains this uh, material. So this particular uh, sample is from uh, Ocean Drilling Program site, uh, 850, and on here we've also got the, the number of the core and also the depth in centimetres um, down that core. So we know exactly where this sample originated from. Now you might be able to see at the bottom here, we have 
a, um, a residue that has been um, left to dry in here. So we have um, a powder at the bottom. But before, you, before it dries, what we need to do is to actually mount that material um, for, uh, on a microscope slide to enable us to look at radiolaria in, um, under the microscope. So what we would do um, is to use microscope slides like this, glass microscope slides, to enable us to look at radiolaria under a transmitted light microscope, similar to the one that's behind me. So we would want to put this um, on a firm surface, or ideally we would like to, we, we need to put this on a, on a, a warm hot plate, but I haven't got one here uh, on, on the desk at the moment. But it, so either use a, a firm surface or a hot plate in which to do this. Um, so there's a microscope slide, and in order to mount the material, the sediment, we need to uh, have a glass cover slip. Now the glass cover slip is what we actually put the material onto. So we would have a, perhaps a, a, a line of these glass cover slips, and then of the material, we would take a pipette and take out some of the material and drop it onto the cover slip. Now, the cover slip, um, you should put enough material on there that it covers the entire cover slip. And then you simply leave that to dry. Now, that on a hot plate will won't take very long, but if you're just letting it to air, leaving it to air dry, that may, may, may take a little while. But once it is dry then, we need to put a mounting medium on the cover plate, on the cover slip, um, in order to enable us to, to mount it onto a glass microscope slide. Now, the mounting medium that I tend to use um, is Canada Balsam, but there are others available, such as uh, a, a one commonly used called Nafrax, um, but you've got to make sure it's got a high enough uh, refractive index that it makes the um, radiolaria stand out uh, when you're looking at under the microscope slide. But Canada Balsam is ideal. And you would simply um, either pipette or you perhaps use a glass rod to put Canada Balsam onto the dried residue on the cover slip. Um, and on a warm uh, hot plate, the, the Canada Balsam or the mountant would, would spread um, because, it was, because it's warm. And you leave it there really until it's spread to the edge of the cover slip and air bubbles that may be trapped within the fossils has had time to uh, be um, expelled, so there are no air bubbles in the slide. Because if there are air, air bubbles, it will affect um, your, your ability to examine and sometimes identify uh, the fossils. So once that's dry, you would take your glass microscope uh, slide and you would invert it onto the, the sticky mountain. And when you bring it up, the, the slide would be, the cover slip with the mountain would be stuck um, on there, and uh, you would then leave that glass microscope slide to just settle down and to allow that cover slip to, to slide down onto and become embedded onto the, onto the slide. Of course, at this point as well, you would want to label the slide um, either with a sticky label uh, with the full um, sample number on it, um, or you can also use a, a glass etching pen to describe the uh, the, the, the label on there the, with the sample details. So that's how you would actually uh, create a, a mount, uh, process the sediment and then mount it on a glass microscope slide for examination.